Welcome to a Sonic Talk special. This isn't a live version today because um, I'm going to a wedding tomorrow, so it would probably be inappropriate for me to be broadcasting at that particular time. But anyway, I want to say thank you very much for listening. There will be no live chat room participation or any such thing, but thank you. Also, this is sponsored by Isotope. Uh, a message from them later, but there will be no competition results, though, uh, th- for, for this week so i want to say thanks very much and also we're going to be talking to a very special guest and i will introduce him right away here we have axel hartman synth designer extraordinaire man of much experience at sitting in a room with some very beautiful pieces of hardware you didn't design the poly Moog, did you <laughs> i was too young then <laughs> i used to listen to it when i was um a kid and um it was one of those pieces that i always wanted to to have in my collection yeah, and uh, there was that day where I found it on eBay in a, in a good condition. So I thought I, I must have that and play it. It's working fine. <laughs> nice one. You and me both, mate. I tell you, it's uh, that's one of the ones. That and the um, EMS Synthi AKS, the one in the su- the suitcase. I've always wanted as well. That's that's been. I'm I'm a big fan of synths with luggage you know i don't know why it is oh yeah yeah well i'm not so much anymore today because uh, i'm still playing music a lot and uh, i like lightweight uh, gear uh, in the meantime but um sometimes fat synths sound fat you know you you need the weight to make them sound right the the poly is is a special thing you know you don't want to carry him around at all because uh, of those big boards that are sitting in there so even if I, I schlep it around in my office, uh, I'm always very, very careful. That's yeah, it's one of those things great. that just doesn't like to move, yeah. is it? You kind of, it's working, right. don't touch right. it! <laughs> no, don't. don't. So Axel, um, uh, the reason we got you on is, uh, I mean, just the, the amount, just the sheer amount of design work that you've done uh, across the, the board of, uh, uh, you know, electronic instruments is astonishing. But you actually started out, you know, your your design box company is an industrial design company, uh, which you started uh, 95, I believe, if I've got my, excuse me, my facts right. Yeah, um, bless you. Yeah. How did you start, That's... how did you get into the, you know, how did you make this transition from industrial design into, uh, spe- spe- you know, into specialising into the electronic instrument? What was the sort of first break? Well, actually, it's been the other way around. Um, ah. I always wanted to be a musician, and um, it didn't work when I was younger. Uh, I was uh, afraid of going the, the pro way, you know, of, of skipping all school and university, everything, and just playing music. I was afraid of that. So I didn't do it, and um, I was always playing music, and I still do, like I told you. So uh, it was only natural for me to, to bring together those two uh, I would say two sides of my uh, my skills. Um, I, I was always a pretty good painter, and I did like design a lot. And there's a lot of musicians that that have both of those sides. You know, they're musicians and they're artists, or so. And uh, I studied design then, and uh, uh, already when I was uh, in uh, still still studying in in, in Germany in a, in a design school, I was. Um, uh, trying to focus on uh, musical instruments, electronic musical instruments, to be more precise. And uh, it was my uh, diploma, that's what we call the final thing that you do when you study design in in Germany, was already uh, a workstation that was back in 1989. Uh, So that was the hot thing back in those days to do a nice workstation and that was my diploma. So this was the first step into this this world of music, uh, where I, it was always my plan to bring those two things together. And I left school and I did write some letters out to Fairlight, to Sinclair, who was still alive back in those days. And I heard from a good friend of mine who's a pro keyboard player in Germany. He told me that uh, Wolfgang Dürren was planning a new uh, asset or, or a new startup on, on the PPG technology, which was very famous back in those days yeah. still. And so I, 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 I called him. He wasn't living so far away from my home, so it was like an hour and a half drive. And he, he was very interested, and he came to me, and I was hired directly after after university from Waldorf. Ah. So um, 
this were the first steps then into the this pro MI business for me as a designer. And when I worked for Waldorf, uh, I, I worked there from the year of 89 uh, until I started Designbox, my own company. So almost six years. And um, I learned a lot there uh, about how to not only do industrial design, but also how to focus on uh, working out a product that works in the market. And uh, I had deep insight into every everything that makes a synthesizer. You know? On the manufacturer so, and everything. Everything. Oh, well, yeah, what, everything uh, the advertising, um, the, the entire artwork, everything that was related to visuals and artwork was my work. And uh, because Waldorf was, is, or still is such a small company, uh, we were sitting in, in one room. You know? yeah. So uh, I had insight into everything. That was very, very cool for me. That's really, I mean, that's often the best way. I mean, it's, it, it, while it's great to specialise, it's you can't beat having an overall view of uh, everything. I, I, I'm a, I'm, it always makes me cringe when people say, I know nothing about technology, but I happen to be in charge of a really massive technology company. It makes me kind of cringe. You think, well, that's really not, oh, yeah. that's not the way to do it, surely. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you started off, I mean, I'm guessing uh, with, with Waldorf, we're talking about sort of microwave, uh, I've got some shots here, and microwave two, which on the face of it actually aren't, um, you know, it, in terms of interface and what have you, haven't got an enormous amount of, uh, I guess, work to do. I suppose, I'm trying to put this in, you know, just when it's a very simple mm -hmm. interface, it's more about style and, and, and the kind of look of the thing rather than may maybe the GUI and usability. So I, Absolutely, I, yeah. So did you get involved in designing the actual workflow of the menu systems and the software behind it as well? As well, yes. Yes, that's, that's, that's the fortunate thing you know, because I'm a, a synthesizer nerd since I was 13 years old. Uh, that's always been uh, uh, one of my favorite things to, to dive into how these machines work. So uh, I also had the chance to, to lay my hands on, on how... how this instrument does function where the main functions are located and how you uh, can access an instrument in an easy way that doesn't offer so many uh, user interface elements. So right. I know it's a, the 19 inch devices, they, they're always more like a graphic design than you do there. You just have a front panel, uh, you have a, sometimes a display and then you have a few knobs and buttons and that's it. So uh, there's a lot of uh, I would not say industrial design, it's more a graphic design that you do there. Um, but uh, the interesting thing with, with uh, the, the microwave one was that um, still you need to find a way to, to, um, to show the user how, how you want to want to work with the sound. So we have this, uh, you always have um, different um, things that you want to do when you do industrial design. You, you need to fulfill the needs of the user, but you also have to fulfill the need of the manufacturer. He wants an instrument that is easy to produce, that is, uh, yeah. is, is visible and recognizable in the market, that is cheap to be made, you know, as cheap as possible, not, not cheap. Yeah, not poor but quality, but yeah, cheap in the, yeah, in the, yeah. In the low, low cost. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then there's... Uh, well, the user experience, the workflow needs to be right, besides all the insights, you know. Um, so this this combination is something that's, that's uh, my, my favorite thing to do still today. I'm working for a lot of, of those companies out there and uh, do a lot of different stuff. But when, when it comes to designing a synthesizer, no matter what kind of or what box it will sit in later on, it's still one of my favorite things to bring the functionality to the outside, to the user, and, and show him how, how he can access... Uh, this uh, technology yeah that's that's the most interesting thing and it's a very good way to start with a 19 inch device yeah i'd There's imagine so much hidden in there i'd imagine yeah that sort of thing is, is a great way to cut your teeth because then of course you've got on to i mean this must have been a joy to you you got you were involved in the the wave which is kind of completely the opposite i mean this must have been like an adventure playground for you to work on as, yeah. a, as a designer yeah. right yeah, that's that's right. But uh, the interesting thing is that it's the same thing like the microwave. You know, it's the same engine, the same kind of functions, exactly the same kind of functions. Uh, but you have a knob for each function or, or a push button. So, so um, this is the opposite, uh, like I said, um, of of the in the design process. Um, but um, you're still dealing with exactly the same kind of technology and functionality behind it. So, isn't that great <laughs> that you can have? all of it in such a small box yeah and when you expand it 
it's it's all there in this big thing. And still, you want the Waldorf still wants the the family look. You you, you want to see that this small, tiny box with the ten elements. It's the same company like this big one, and this is this is the challenge. The consistency. Something that's the fun part. Yeah. So I'm guessing uh, with something like the Wave, I mean, uh, what's kind of interesting about you know, knob per function kind of synthesizers is essentially, you know, they're all pretty much based on the kind of template set by the Minimoog, you know, in terms of, you know, that sort of thing. Are you very conscious of the design history of synthesizers when you're approaching something that has a knob per function? Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, even if the PPG or the Wave was something totally new, in, in its basic setup, it was still like a Minimoog. You know, you have the, the oscillators, the place where the sound is being generated, uh, you're, you're having a mixer, you're having the filters, you're having the envelopes, you have the low frequency oscillator. So everything works together in kind of the same way like it did with, with a Minimoog. Uh, maybe a bit more clever, it is, uh, everything is um, programmable, you know, but in basic, like, like the engine works the same way. Yeah. Uh, like in the car, you know, and uh, so um, it's not a good thing for the user to reinvent or something that that's obvious, uh, or to try to to hide it behind something that's uh, not clear. So so this is something uh, that um, as long as you're handling with the same kind of modules and setup of modules, I think it's it's the right thing to go back to uh, to uh, to um, something that that people know. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely true. It's fascinating. I mean, are there? I mean, you're also involved in dust, in industrial design, where where it's functionality uh, and more, perhaps mm -hmm. more utility. Are there sort of basic design principles that are different between working on something that is used for creative purposes, whereas opposed to you know a functional unit that has to be specifically utilitarian? Yeah, that's that's another very interesting point when you design a musical instrument or an electronic musical instrument like a synthesizer. It needs to speak the tech language very well, but it also needs to to tickle the, the creative senses. So this is another thing that comes together in, in such a machine. Um, it, it, it's hard to explain, but um, when you design a synthesizer, you don't design something really beautiful. You design something that's beautiful to a certain kind of people, that it speaks uh, right. to me or to you or to all those crazy guys that, that make music with, with electronic machines, you know? So uh, you need to catch that vibe. You need to bring in this uh, engineer factor. And then there's the form factor uh, that, that wants to say something as well. If you look at the little fatty from MOOC, it has all the ergonomics that, that you want to have in a synthesizer, but then it has this rounded back, which is something that is, you can do that in any way that you want, but this was kind of, well, it's, it's organic. It's something that people find nice, and that, that is um, something that um, not usually comes together in a technological uh, instrument, you know? So um, this is, something that I always try to do. I try to catch um, uh, a vibe, something that, that, that makes uh, an, uh, an instrument, uh, something that we, we can see there was a designer's hand on it, and right. somebody who has an eye and who, who makes, takes care of the right balance. But um, this is something that comes after uh, the, the function, you know, the, the form always follows the function. This is something where I, the way how I learned to, to design things, not only musical instruments, uh, it's, uh, it's a very basic formula that, that is not uh, my invention. You know, it's something that everybody knows. And that, that's knows a basic design principle. Function. That's yeah. a basic design principle. Right. Right. Okay. That's a, that's right. A, that, that's interesting to know. So, in terms of a the life cycle of you know starting from I've got I'd really like to make a synthesizer. How, what is the mm -hmm. how, what is the process? I mean, how does it generally kind of map? Out from sort of A to B. Mm -hmm. that's, I know that's it's, a massive um, question. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a. This is depending very much on um, the people you're working with and how experienced the the, the company is that asks for my services. Uh, uh, in some companies like like Moog, 
for example, yeah, you come in and they very much know how a synthesizer has to look like and how it should feel and they have all that history in their backpack. So everything's pretty clear and uh, I start with uh, a layout that, that we do together or they come up with a layout and then I bring it into a different order and, and uh, do my thing. But then there's companies that just want to build a synthesizer. They have a, a great idea, they have a certain kind of technology, but absolutely no, no clue how, how they should start with it. Right. So, uh, uh, and, and these two different ways to start with, with a project like that, they, they, they are very influential on, on how long it will take from step one to, to the final product. Uh, there's so many uh, different things that can happen on the road, you know, and uh, I, there, there, there's no principal uh, no, okay. thing that I could say, you know. Um, I, I could only uh, tell you an example for this or that of this machine, but um, there's no rule in uh, how, how long the different phases take. For my work, it's almost always the same, but uh, then um, to, to get that design then uh, into the product it, it, it may take long or not long so, so that that's that's the big difference oh, between the companies that's, that's interesting and do you when when you're when you're working on the design i mean obviously you've got you know as your experience has grown and grown and grown in terms of the whole manufacture process are you involved in sourcing and suggesting components or is it mostly the front facing components like the knob types or the lcd or the the buttons mm -hmm. or that kind of thing i mean how how involved are you getting in the actual electronics of the whole uh, process uh, more and more today uh, we're when I was a young designer in, in 89 or 1990 uh, I started uh, to, to with my work by drawing pictures on paper and uh, uh, this but that's not the process anymore you you come up with an idea and uh, very very fast you start working uh, on a 3D system. I got two people working in my company who just run uh, SolidWorks. It's an engineering tool, a 3D software. Yeah. And uh, we integrate not only the components that go to the front panel, but also all the boards, all the, uh, the, the connectors, everything that's, that's uh, uh, in the product later on, because it all influences the way the design can be. Uh, so, um, the the art, or the, what 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 you what you people usually would bring in context with the designer, this part where you do the soft things, you know, is very small. The, the much greater part is how to, to bring all the technical parts and 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 uh, components into this box and bring them in good order, and uh, get a nice shape for a very nice and easy to produce um, uh, casing. You know, this, this, that's the challenge. I think that, that must be something that I, I don't th necessarily think people always consider because people always kind of go, oh, that's really expensive and what have you, you know, th because of this. But they don't always understand that the, the, uh, a fact, that the effect that uh, component choice and, you know, mm -hmm. maybe getting components from, you know, where you've sourced them to the factory where they're all put together. I mean, does it, does right. it change massively depending on where the synthesizer is manufactured because obviously a lot of synthesizers these yeah. days are made in China you know that were assembled in China or you know parts of them are made in yes. China do you find that working with manufacturing in different parts of the world mm -hmm. will change the design process oh yes it does it does absolutely um, what we do today is only possible because we have this technology and this is something that we only have for 10 12 15 years maybe I remember when I did my first um, uh, keyboards for it was emu we did some controller keyboards that were manufactured in china and we made this design and we made it on a 3d system but it was not a very professional 3d system so it was just to, to show the outlines the pictures and the designs they they were sent to emu and emu they brought them to china and they could simply could not follow our ideas so the design came out totally different because uh, the the people they were not uh, um, in in China. They were not ready to to uh, really work uh, things out like we were thinking they could, you know. Ah, and okay. uh, but but there's a this this changed totally changed. You know they they're much more reliable and they're much better now in in China. So uh, we we work everything out on the 3D system, 
And uh, it doesn't really matter where the instruments are being manufactured. Maybe in China it's it's cheaper, but then on the other hand, you always have to pay this uh, buy this high quantities. You need somebody who's uh, taking care of the quality, uh, which is. It's a really big, big deal, challenge. yeah. I mean, yeah. that's the, that's the yeah. thing that you seem to find, you know, when when things are first announced at, at trade shows and you see a kind of, right. a, a, not a, a, like a production prototype, effectively, where there may be only four, five or ten made, and then that right. transition yeah. from going, okay, now we need to scale this up and build, you know, mm. 10,000 of them, the right. quality yeah. control on that side of it is it is a massive challenge. It seems to be one of the biggest, and to find yeah. the specialised people who can deal with that is is hard, I'd imagine. Yeah, there's. Um, um, if you're running a synthesizer company, you're never, or almost never, uh, in 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 production sizes like you should be when you're producing an industrial product. You know, if you have a consumer product like a, a cellular phone or or a, um, um, a photo machine yeah, 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 or something sure. like that, they they run into hundred thousands, millions of units that yeah. you sell. In music or in synthesizer, especially in synthesizer, when you're talking 10,000 units, not in a year, over a lifetime, it's already a lot. And um, so to, to get such a high-end product like a synthesizer, it has everything that any consumer high-end product has, plus some more special things. Uh, you need to find a manufacturer who can really do that and who can do that in a way that the user, the people that buy the product later on, they, don't, they need to be satisfied with that quality, you know. Uh, but if you only sell 10,000 units only, it's not so many that it's worth hiring somebody who yeah. just takes care of just takes the care quality of the QA, right. in China because it, it's too much cost. and. Um, so th this is the big challenge, the, the big challenge, you know. So today it's like that. You, you're producing in China. You're having some companies who can do the job. There's maybe a handful of companies that do uh, synthesizers or master keepers. They work in our domain. And then there's companies in China that, that take care of the quality. They pick out uh, uh, products of a, of a stock that's being sent uh, to Europe. And, and then uh, they find... Uh, some problems or not, and then the manufacturer has to to rework. So, this is the the big challenge in in working with foreign companies. If you send something out to China to have a, a very uh, yeah. very good pricing, and then that you can compete. Um, I imagine there's a point at which it becomes uh, like a diminishing returns. It costs so much money to to to, to vet the quality that. You know that you end right. up actually. You know it'd be cheaper actually to yeah. make it in the factory down the road, where you can actually just go down there and say, "Yeah, that's fine." You know? Exactly, and that's what what people do. If if you look at Waldorf, for example, I'm work, still working for them, and uh, they do everything in Germany. It's possible. So uh, you can find companies that work for those low uh, quantities that that do a good job, and then it's also if if you look at the pricing that they have. Uh, it's also doable in a in a good price range. Yeah. So and then there's access that do all their uh, synthesizers in Germany. They're high pricey, but they're very good quality. So it's it depends a lot on the business concept that you have. As yeah, well. I guess so. Right. Well, we'll come. I'm just going to have a message from our sponsors, and then we'll come right back. And I've got a few okay. more questions. Thank you. Isotope Iris is a groundbreaking sample-based synthesizer. Iris is a new spin on sound design. It's a virtual instrument that's perfect for inspiration and sonic experimentation. In fact, born on this very show out of uh, an idea that came out of uh, RX technology. Uh, natural intuitive selection tools. You can ma manipulate your audio visually. You can see an image of your sound. You draw and select individual events. Shape shifting. Apply synthesis controls to your selections. Shape and morph new textures. Enjoy warm, lush filters, delays, reverbs, chorus and distortions for each layer. Masses of sound libraries. Mix the sound of wood, glass, food, toys, voice, altered and prepared objects as well as crazy modular synths. Seeing a lot of glass in this uh, particular video if you're watching the live feed. Uh, pitch percussion with the Iris expansion packs. Download a free... 10 day demo of Isotope Iris today, isotope.com forward slash Iris. Incidentally, there is a sale through May 30th on Iris and the Iris Plus 8 bundle, which includes all eight Iris sound libraries. Again, just go over to isotope.com forward slash Iris. 
and we thank them very much for their continued sponsorship of the show. So I just wanted to come back to you. Uh, I have some more questions. You'll be pleased to know. I hope you don't mind me asking you. Um, so in, in terms of, you know, your dream design gig, is it is it something that is, you know, nod per function? Like, you know, you're involved in the Schmidt, which is, you know, in many ways is seen mm-hmm. as the pinnacle of sort of excessive polysynth electronics, which is fantastic. I mean, when you got that call, were you just thinking, wow, what a great job? Or is it, do they all have different challenges? They all have different challenges, it's, and, and that's the beauty of the of the job that I'm doing. So, uh, uh, most of all, I, I really enjoy to to have the chance to work together with all those brilliant brains that we have in this this domain. You know, uh, Schmidt uh, is named after his inventor, and this guy is uh, just a brilliant engineer. And uh, what what a character! <laughs> it was great to meet him and to see him and to find his philosophy, and then. Um, just to um, to put this this hood over his technology, you know, everything was already set from his side, so there was not so much work for me to do on the on the front panel layout that was already kind of set. All the all the functionality, I only did the graphic design and the casing, and everything that um, that you can see. But uh, what's behind it that was was done by just one guy who was working on that machine for I don't know five it's a, or six Yeah, it's an years. amazing story, isn't it? Yes, and then there's uh, Stefan Hund uh, uh, who has been financing that in mean, big part. So that there's people out there crazy enough to, to spend years of their life in a machine like that. And Schmidt is not the only guy. You know, I had this call from Australia just uh, one and a half years ago where a very famous uh, sampler company was calling me because they had a new project that was also very exciting. And um, it's, it's always the story behind the machine and I'm such an well old school guy. I'm doing that now for 20 years just in my in my job. But uh, I'm living in this music for so many years and I still get um, goosebumps if I can meet and talk with people like Tom Oberheim or Dave Schmidt, Dave Smith, Schmidt Smith. Oh, that's great. Isn't it? <laughs> that's an um, interesting thought. I, Collaboration, yeah. perhaps. <laughs> so so. It, I'm, I'm so happy that I can be part of this and, and giving my work or putting in my my work into into those uh, technological uh, this technology sure. that 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 is um, producing the sounds that we love so much. Uh, so um, that's that's the most beautiful thing. So uh, the other thing I was kind of wondering is, you know, out of the work that you have done, has there been a perfect storm? Because, I mean, a synthesizer becomes classic for a couple of reasons. I'm, I, I, you know, as an outsider, you know, there's the design aspect and there's the sound aspect. You know, has there been so far, you know, the one that, it, 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 like I say, is the perfect storm that you've just been particularly proud of? I'm sure you're proud of all your work and I'm not asking you to, 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 to choose from your children, as it were. But there must be a sort yeah. of specific project that has just really come together in a, in a perfect perfect way for you mm, that's that's very difficult to answer because each of my kids has uh, its own story and um, so if you if you look at the the little fatty I think that was a very very nice story behind that it was the last synth that that Bob Mook did by himself and uh, I was involved with it and I could talk to Bob and we worked together on this and uh, so Maybe this is the instrument for me that that is probably something that really will stay for for quite a while. But on the other hand, uh, the Andromeda when I designed that, sure. I thought that let let let's. I wanted to think a little bit out of the box. I want to give the modules a new kind of uh, idea, you know, to have the, the center function in the well in the center of the module and then spread out like little galaxies. So that was the idea behind that. Even if it was uh, translated into an instrument that's kind of plastic around, you know, which was not actually what I really wanted. But if you look at the user interface, this is something that was a kind of a new way to to translate uh, analog uh, into a user interface. Uh, I'm, I'm quite proud of that work, even if if many people were um, not so positive. Well, there, there was. I mean, I guess the thing about the uh, Andromeda is, you know, it's, it is considered to be a classic, and there were. There were two manufacture processes, weren't there? There was one which was perhaps a little more robust than the second manufacture process. So depending mm-hmm. on which one you've got, you know, depends on how yeah. how robust it is. And that's, I guess, that's something that's out of your hands. But I mean, 
you know, as a as a project, it was very ambitious. Absolutely, yeah, it was, and it. Uh, I don't know if it really <laughs> killed the leases. I'm not sure, but it was it was very ambitious. Let's let's just take it like that. Uh, the wave is still something where I would say that that was uh, like a childhood dream, and uh, I remember we were those, that crazy back in those days. We said, well, we want to make the most deep synthesizer. It must be deeper than the Matrix 12 because that was the dream machine back in those days, and we made it. It's deeper and heavier. Are you looking at and one now? Can, Are you actually yeah, looking? I'm at one? looking at it now. It's sitting. It's sitting here. In the shop. Maybe you cannot see, but I have to turn the the screen. Oh. You can see it. I have the Matrix 12 there. And this is the wave, and it's deeper. You kind of look into the shelf, but it's really deeper <laughs> than, than the Matrix 12. So that And that was um, something, I would almost say, that was something that I did when I was really, really young. And it has a certain kind of vibe uh, to it that, that, that you cannot catch when you're older and more experienced. It's probably a little fresher and uh, mm. with less... Um, less thoughts in your back, you know, the, the, the wave was design. very hard yeah. to produce. It was really, really hard to produce. I would make it totally different today because I know so much more about uh, manufacturing things. But uh, um, we got a design award for it, and I think it's a classy. Uh, it's, it's a dinosaur, and it will stay like that. You can even find it uh, when, you, when you look into garage band. if you look into the synthesizers, a little small uh, comic synthesizers in there. Their icon is a wave, so I'm very proud of that. That's yeah, cool. yeah, nice one. Uh, what do they call skew? You, you, you've reached the uh, pinnacle of uh, was it skewamorphism? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Great. <laughs> Excellent. That's great. Yeah. So, um, is there uh, speaking of software? I mean, you presume, uh, I, I, if I understand correctly, you've also been involved in the design of some GUI aspects to software synthesizers too, is that right? Right, yeah, yeah, that's that's right. So I'm, um, you, you know the Nave synthesizer, yeah. which I did for Waldorf for the iPad, and uh, then I did some uh, some work for MOOC for, for their um, uh, synthesizers or for, for the... Uh, um, how do you say a plugin uh, or, or the, the, the Animo? How do you say, is it the, remote, the remote version? Ah. The Animo, not. It's not ah. my work. Okay. No, not. But uh, but then their um, remote control um, uh, software that ah, you can yes, use okay. together with the, the Taurus or, or the the, the, uh, the little fatty. And then there's um, a lot of work that I did for Antares. You know, Antares. Yeah. Um, they do the uh, auto tune yeah. thingy. You know, I did. A lot of work for them, and for uh, Universal Audio, I do a lot of work. Uh, so that, but that's more um, uh, like bringing uh, something that exists in reality, bringing to the screen. So it's more of a sort of modeling, just how old right. it needs to look and uh, aging yeah. and all of that kind of thing. So in terms yeah. of software, I'm curious because as a designer, um, it's the mm -hmm. it's almost the purest. If you're designing an interface for for that, it's the pu it's it's real design purity because you don't really have to worry about the manufacturer cost or the componentry or any of that other stuff. I mean, do you find that a different? Is that is it as satisfying? I mean, or uh, I guess it might be a, a slightly shorter creative cycle for you, right? Oh yes, it is. Uh, I, I, the the problem with with um, GUI design is that you really have to get into the pixels. It's really, how do you say, uh, anstrengend. So you, you need to, it, it takes Macro. a lot of energy if you right. work like that all day. And, then it's in this pixel. and it's like that, you know, you really have to bring it one pixel up and then it's okay, one pixel down, it's not okay anymore. So you really have to get into that. And uh, I, fortunately, I have my people here that do all the, the chicken work, you know, and I, I'm, I'm doing the the big, big picture, picture yeah. and then I have my, my people here that, that do all the chopping. In the meantime, I did it myself years ago, but now I can just give this work away and just do the creative part. And that's fun. It's it's nice, but it's a totally different challenge. You know, it's it's about the workflow, usability, um, make it a quick and easy accessible a UI. Uh, and sure, you're not bound to any um, um, constructional constraints or things like that, but yeah, it's a different kind of job. It's nice, but if I had the choice to do a synthesizer in hardware or in software, uh, personally, I would always go hardware because it's uh, you need more all the skills that you have, uh, right. not only visually. Uh, yeah. 
And of course, uh, it's, in terms of designing hardware synthesizer, you know, famously there's the Hartman Neuron, which is kind of your own uh, take on a, a specific instrument which you produced yourself. What were you trying right. to achieve with that? Because it was very advanced for the time, wasn't it? It was a, a very unique and interesting uh, synthesis method uh, that we haven't seen right. yeah. much of uh, subsequently. Yeah, well, that, that was um, back in those days. I, I always wanted to, to build my own synthesizer, but I'm, I'm not, uh, uh, I, I cannot write uh, a synthesizer software. So sure. I can only spend an idea and, and do the do the organization of the hardware and everything. So that's what I did with the, with the Neuron. Uh, I found Stefan Bernsey uh, back in those days, and he had the the software that could could accomplish this idea. The idea, the basic idea, was to have something that is easy to operate, that people understand and know, which is an analog synthesizer. But to to dive into the oscillators, the heart of this of the engine, they should do something different and easy. So the idea was to have something, some audio material that you could form with uh, real world uh, attitudes. You know that that was the idea behind it, and to to accomplish that. Uh, you you need some kind of model of a sound, uh, right. like a virtual model, you know, and that that was the idea behind it. Very much derived from what we do every day here when we do our three D three D work, you know, we, we build virtual reality, and I want to build virtual sound, and give it, um, extract the parts that make a sound interesting and and make them accessible on a hardware. That was the idea behind it, and and Stefan Bernsey he had exactly that code. The problem back in those days was that that uh, there was no, not really a computer out there who, who could handle all the all the uh, data manipulating in in, in real real time. Uh, so that 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 probably was the big problem with it. It did. I mean, it looked beautiful. Awesome. It did look very beautiful. Yeah. I remember interviewing you in uh, I think it's probably the first time we met actually at Music Mesa when you yeah. when you actually yeah. had a great looking stand, and then. Um, do, you, do I mean so you know with that experience now? Do you still feel? Do you feel that there's a synthesizer that needs to be made? I mean, are there areas you know because you must consistently see you know uh, in terms of subtractive synthesis? You know, we're kind of we're seeing these iterations that I guess the the the, the latest innovations are, appear to be more in the digital control of the analog electronics. But you know, for instance, mm -hmm. there are other areas of synthesis which haven't really been explored. In a, from a GUI point of view and a design point, I'm thinking maybe FM synthesis, something like that. I mean, do you have any kind of? Mm -hmm. There's the gig you're waiting to get that you'd like that the synthesizer that you think should be made. Yeah, well, I would love to to pick up the the idea of the neuron again and and uh, make it right, you know. Uh, but um, something that I didn't know back in those days when I started this project uh, was that that uh, to to do something like that, you need a lot of money in your bank. That's that's the final word on everything. If you're not uh, having the money in your bank, you will run into problems at a certain time, and um, most likely it will be uh, a bad time when you run into these problems, like it was with, with, uh, with my own company. So, first you need the million, then you can start thinking. That's that's uh, that's the problem, and I think there's. Yeah, Reinventing analog in so many different ways is a nice thing because people they drive cars every day, and uh, they cars have four wheels. They have an engine. You have to four seats. You sit in there, and they do their thing. And it's it seems like this is the thing with synthesizers as well. You have these different modules, and uh, they all together are able to to produce this kind of sound that that we all like. Uh, then there's a stream coming now. It's it's a modular stream a yeah, little bit. Absolutely. You, can, you can feel that. And uh, so uh, there's things going on, but basically it's all about uh, analog circuitry or, or virtual analog circuitry. So you need to have really, if you want to go a new way, like I tried with, with the neuron back in those days, you really need uh, a lot of money, a lot of fantasy and a lot of how would you say mood? Yeah, I, motivation. You got to, you got to. Really, motivation. Yeah. You need balls to do that. You know, bring something up that's really new, and people, if you bring something new and it looks different, not everybody loves it. You know, you will, you will be hated by some people. They will cheat at you and tell you, oh, what the fuck? Well, it doesn't sound right, and because it, it doesn't follow what they think it should. Yeah. Uh, so um, 
you really need to, and then you need to make it right. And uh, that, that's a, a big challenge, you know. There's a lot of things that you could do. If, if you only follow this, this idea that I have with Anuran or that Stefan and me together had, uh, if you do that right, there's, uh, it's, it could be groundbreaking, you know. But um, it needs to be so right and people need to really understand yeah. and uh, you need to be careful if, if you're doing an instrument, a musical instrument that you want to sell to people and you need to sell it to make everything work. You don't want to overdo it, you know. I think the neuron was not only the way it looked different, it had only one wooden side, everything was on the side, the outputs, and it had this different way of thinking in it and there was maybe too much innovation in one spot right that's okay. something that I sometimes are, think because well, musicians are actually fairly conservative individuals when it comes down to it don't they there's yeah, like, yeah. you know uh, but, and that stems from being able to repeat things you know there's the uh, i think at the heart mm. of many people who work creatively there's this insecurity that if the tools are too different they won't be able to do their thing and they'll be found out as some kind of fraud it's this sort of massive insecurity in, that just inherent yeah. in yeah. our in our in our industry, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's it's always a, a balance, you know. If you look at the new Nord A1 synthesizer that has this beautiful oscillator where you can just run through the different waveforms and the different ad aspects of a waveform from one point to the other, that's such a cool idea. But I, I bet there's a lot of people out there that say, well, but I want to stop here and then I want to make it, really I want to go into the detail, but that's not possible uh, because you have this quick access and then you work in a different way on that but in our domain people are not like sometimes not everybody but are not happy with what they get but they're seeking for something that they can't get because it's like this i can't get that hey what's yeah, that you know what sure. understand what i mean so so uh, with a neuron you have the option to really s go through the sound and, and find your sweet spot and but everything around was not usable so so that's okay, we trash it away. But there's a lot of people who say, well, but I want to really get in this point and then I want to work on it like I would work on an analog synthesizer. So, but you cannot have both. You can't you know, have everything. It's really, difficult. Right, you, you, read, you need to commit to some kind of way how things work. Yeah. And the acceptance for something like that, it was bigger back in those days, when, when in the historic days, when you had a Solina string ensemble that could just do strings in a bad way. Then you have the synthesizer, monophonic, then you have the Wooly, the keyboard. So, And nobody complained. They all, only thing was, well, I don't want to schlep around all that stuff. So please give me something like a workstation where I have everything in one box. Yeah. And then they start complaining, oh, it's everything in one, in one box. It's just a black box. It's not creative. I want knobs. <laughs> then you bring back knobs. And then they say, oh, there's not enough, enough RAM in there. Look, look at the, the Nord, the, the, the stage. It's a nice thing. But then you only have 500 megabytes. Give me the Kronos. Oh, but that's only a black box. Yeah. I want back my modules. So <laughs> uh, you can't have everything. I'm, but that's a good thing because you need to have everything. Evolution, that's yeah. Something. Yes. So you collect your synthesizers like I, like you do maybe. You, you have a lot of different machines and, and every machine has its beauty. Yeah. And so the good thing true. today is that um, the stream is getting back a little bit. So, so if you look at the micro brood from Arturia, so, so you have monophonic synthesizers. They even don't have, uh, you, you cannot program them. It's yeah. just an instrument where you fiddle around with it and it's fun. So um, this is something that people experience. This experience we had back in those days all the time and we hated that experience, but it was still it was something nice and it's nice to have these instruments back where people I think, really work. I, I think, yes, I mean, I think the thing is, is we ended up in the, when when uh, the advent of the, digi uh, the digital stuff, the DX7, the D50, those things enabled us to have an enormous palette of preset browsing sound. So it was a very different kind of it was finding that patch, wasn't it? It was doing that sort of thing. Right. But, uh, and right, now right. it seems to be very much more about the process than about the selection process, I suppose. Yeah, yeah for, for many people. Not for everyone, no, but... sure. And, you know, if you're, if you're making, nice. yeah. if you're making, if you're scoring for a film uh, where you've got to recall mm -hmm. cues, you know, it, it's not going to work right. for you because yeah. it's physically difficult to modify things straight away. And I think that's we've got these two areas. We've got professional music, which is, you know, I need a recall of a mix. I need you to redo it at a different tempo with a different sound, change this sound, change. And if you're using analog gear, that's much harder to do. Um, mm -hmm. But that's on the commercial side. Whereas if you're uh, 
somebody who's doing it more for pleasure, you've got all the time in the world to get lost in your modular. And these two branches are sort of mm -hmm. a hard, you know, managing the analog love is harder to do in a commercial environment. That's just the way it that's, is. That, that's, that's right. This is the reason why Hans Zimmer is hiring lots of people to just do this for him. You know, he's having this massive uh, system uh, sitting in the backside of, uh, of his studio and uh, he doesn't run them because he doesn't have the time. But he has the people who can and he has the, the creative mind and he tells the people what to do. So uh, if you have the, let's say, let's say the, yeah. the environment, yeah, you, you, can have, uh, you can have both worlds and uh, the, you're a top uh, Song, songwriter <laughs> or, or uh, that's an interesting idea then. isn't it it's sort of taking yeah. the notion of you know what used to be the role of a programmer um to be yep. uh, you know i'm a professional synthesis what a great job Pro yep. probably oh yes and that and there's there's people working at hans studio oh. howard scar for example he's, yeah. he's just doing that and more people there would do that you know because this kind of sound you want it in your music because it's fresh and it's it's yeah, cool it's you want different. it uh, but it, it's time consuming to do it right and yeah. so you cannot have both so you need somebody who can do it it's like here in my environment uh, you need somebody who has the vision and the ideas and who, who you also need to know how you can come to this vision but the time consuming part you must have the chance to delegate that to give that to somebody and you can rely on he gives it back to you and you bring it into your ideas so it's always yeah. a cooperation Absolutely. Well, Axel, thank you very much. Uh, one more question I wanted to ask, because at the beginning of the yeah. program, you said, you know, you are a, a, an ongoing musician. You play, you know, you collect synthesizers. Right. What, what is it you, uh, what are you currently sort of, you know, just can't leave alone? Do you have a favorite instrument of the moment that you're just kind of, you know, can't put down? I'm, I'm a, big, a big fan of, of Nord. And yep. It's almost the only company I'm not working for, but sometimes it's nicer to eat somebody's bread, you know, than your own. <laughs> uh, if, if you, <laughs> yeah, um, I like their instruments and their attitude. Mm -hmm. They're professional and they're lightweight. That's very, very cool. If I can just mm -hmm. take it in my arm and it's, it's like 30 kilos that I'm schlepping around, you know. Uh, I also like the water stuff a lot, so I'm, I'm using their stuff and I'm also using my MOOC synthesizer. So um, I couldn't really tell you. If I, if I had to say I just want to take one instrument, it would probably right now it would probably be the Nord Stage 2. Right, because you can do the gig right there. I must say Pulse, the Pulse yeah. 2 I reviewed a while back, and that is an awesome instrument oh, yeah. and beautifully, beautifully made, I must say, too. So uh, good job on that. Yeah. And it's all made in Germany, and it's, it's possible, like you see. You don't have to run to China to do um, and a really priced, massive yeah, And reasonably price. priced yeah. as well. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, I think that's probably a good time to, uh, to to wrap things up. And I want to say thank you very much, Axel. That was great to talk to you. It's been a great insight to see, you know, what goes on behind the scenes in terms of design and just to see your workspace and stuff. So I really appreciate you spending the time with us. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you very much for giving me the chance to talk. No problem. Yeah. So that's it for another Sonic Talk. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this episode. We'll be back live uh, next week. Uh, and um, stay tuned where we'll have the results to two isotope competitions. Oh, no, one isotope competition. Last week's competition. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. <laughs>